Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Few things freak people out as much as being alone. Not necessarily in the relationship sense, but the actual deafening and eerie stillness of being isolated in a place where no one would know if something happened to you. When you get down to it, complete isolation sounds horrifying. But for people who work alone, it just becomes part of the process. Scary stories from people who work alone reveal just how lucky you are to work in an office full of co-workers. Sure, they can get annoying, but at least you're among other warm bodies. Much like people who work graveyard shifts, people who work alone tend to become spooked once they realize they might not be alone, but rather in the company of an unknown party. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode… Fog and mist is a staple of creating a perfect horror atmosphere. In some cases, such as in movies like The Fog or The Mist, it's the creeping haze that is the danger itself. But then there's the true story from the Florida woods of a supernatural fog bank that appeared to eat people alive. How did the devil's footprint get into a rock in North Carolina? One of our weirdo family members didn't used to believe in the supernatural, but that changed when he insisted that the ghost prove it exists. Mysterious fires and moving objects have terrified the residents of a house in central Morocco. But first, complete isolation sounds horrifying. But for people who work alone, it's just part of the process. We'll begin with some of their stories. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, my newsletter, to enter contests, to connect with me on social media. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression or dark thoughts. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. Recently, Redditors who work alone shared their most terrifying stories from being on the job – frightful moments that don't in any way sound worth the paycheck. I worked as an assistant in a morgue. As a med student, I got to open and study the bodies that people donated to the university. All the bodies were stored in a giant walk-in freezer. Also, the morgue had a motion sensor system inside the freezer, so if you got stuck inside, an alarm would activate and somebody would come to help you. One time I was working alone because my teacher was doing some paperwork in his office that was in an adjacent building. I heard a lot of noise, but I thought it was my teacher in the other building, or something like that. When suddenly, the alarm goes off, scaring the crap out of me. In that moment, I was like, crap, the teacher is stuck inside the freezer. And when I was running to the freezer, my teacher grabbed my arm and told me, I thought you were inside the freezer. In that moment, we stayed there staring at the door until he stopped the alarm and opened the door. I was behind him with a broom waiting for the worst. When he opened the freezer, we didn't find anything that could activate the motion sensor. There wasn't anybody, at least not alive. We decided that was enough for the day, and we left the morgue early. 
My dad worked at the haunted Toys R Us in Sunnyvale, California. He worked as a night watchman back in the day to pay for school. Cool gig, got to sit around and study while being paid for doing next to nothing. Learned to juggle and play guitar, too. Weird stuff happened there all the time. Objects would fall off shelves as you walked past them. Lights flickered on and off from time to time. Noises from the other side of the hall. Stuff like that. So there he was in a big, mostly dark store all by himself thinking about the ghost. He said aloud, if there's a ghost here, then that balloon, the red one in the middle of the roof, will pop. Right as he finished the sentence, the balloon burst. Suffice to say he turned on all the lights in the building and got as close to a door as he could for the rest of the shift. So my major has a computer lab that is two stories underground. I have spent countless hours using these computers and I've spent nights down in what us students call the dungeon. One night, around 2 a.m., I went down the hall to go get some water. The lights used motion sensors. As I was filling my water bottle, the last light turned on at the end of the hall. So there was this dark gap between me and this last light way down the hall. I was mildly creeped out, but then I saw something move in the darkness between me and the light. I proceeded to nope my way home promptly. I worked overnights in an adolescent RTC for a short time. About a week into the job, I was told about Amanda. Amanda was a resident from around 10 years prior who managed to hang herself in the shower. According to my co-workers, she would sometimes make appearances at night in the form of making a whimpering sound in the supply room, or on very rare occasions, she would actually appear in the corner of the hallway nearest her old room. I blew off the story, thinking they were just messing with the new guy. Until one night, about two months later, I was doing rounds while my partner took a smoke break. I was checking to see if the kids were asleep when I saw a girl sitting in the corner of the hallway with her arms around her knees, which were pulled up to her chin. Something about her body language told me she was really sad. I started to approach her but heard a noise from behind me. I checked to find nothing awry and when I looked back to the corner, the girl was gone. When my coworker returned from his smoke break, I told him what I saw and he said, yep, that's Amanda. He used to be a night janitor in a movie theater. We'd go in at 4 a.m. and clean until the doors opened at 11 a.m. To save time and our jobs, we would sometimes come in around the time the last movies were finishing and just sleep in one of the empty theaters, making sure we'd be there when the shift started. Our basic MO was to use electric leaf blowers up and down the aisles of each theater, blowing popcorn and trash all the way to the bottom, then cleaning the seats up manually for anything gross or larger debris. This was expedient, but it was very loud, so it was easy to lose yourself in the work. Of course, the lights were on in the theaters to better assist in the cleaning, and usually we were the only ones there at the time, so whenever something strange happened, we would chalk it up to the other guy. There was one standing rule, though, that we all followed to the letter. No one in the projection booth. There was no reason to go up there. We didn't clean it. All our supplies were downstairs, and most of all, the projection booth was haunted. There's a phenomenon that happens with theaters and projection booths. No matter what, you always feel like you're being watched. When you're walking around deaf from the sound of the blowers in any empty movie theater and you happen to glance up at the booth and there is unmistakably someone standing there watching you, you will crap your pants. Especially when you go out into the hallway and find the other guy in his theater working. Especially when you both go to either end of the building to the two exits of the booth and trap whoever it was up there, and there's no one there. We just chose not to mess with it. I was working in the villages of Malawi, Africa, and came to one community very isolated and remote. 
The children stopped going to school because these guys were terrorizing them. They were witch doctors, and if caught, they'd take the kids into the cemetery and do crazy things. They also terrorized the widows and others in the community. When they told me the story, I thought they might be exaggerating a bit. I didn't ever feel scared when I was in the villages, and since they're cut off from technology, I thought maybe it was just a bit of folklore passed away to create fear. This one day I was sitting on a banana fibers mat with a widow and drinking tea. I couldn't speak the tribal language, so we just smiled and drank together in silence and peace. All of a sudden I heard, like this grunting sound, an electric bolt of fear crept down my body. I can't even explain how intense this fear was. It's like I just froze and couldn't even turn around. I just felt evil and darkness around me. Anyway, these witch doctors surrounded us for a while and just grunted and hissed and made these animal noises. We didn't move an inch. We never turned around. They were so close and literally right behind us, and all I could think the entire time was I'd feel a spear in my neck any second. After a while, they left, and eventually my transportation arrived. A few other Americans were in other villages and came for my pickup. I remember once I got in the car, I couldn't even speak for a while about what had happened. My words and stories don't do justice to what I felt that day. I never knew darkness like that existed, but it does. I was photographing a waterfall in a deep basin. I was the only one in the basin. I was alone from 6 p.m. to 10.30 p.m. The trail that comes in was right up against a rock face that went straight up and over 400 feet high. When I was heading back up, there were bare, wet human footprints up the stones of the trail. I got to a spot where I see muddy footprints leading into the brush. A few moments later, I heard a blood-curdling scream from the same bushes. The sound, to me, sounded like a mountain lion. They're common in the area. I ran faster than I've ever run before. I called rangers to my mile marker and I've checked back since then. No missing person reports have been filed, nor was anyone's car in that area that night. Easily one of the scariest experiences I've had. Worked as a lab student in Alert, Nunavut. Look it up most northerly inhabited place in the world. I was there for my second term in January, so total darkness. The lab I worked at was an atmospheric lab, so it was far from the main base, maybe five kilometers. Around the lab, there were lifelines leading to all of our instruments outside. However, on this particular Wednesday, which was flasking day, it was a little stormy but nothing too serious. Since I was the student, I did all of the outside flasking. I loaded up a sleigh with evacuated flasks and would walk about 300 meters from the lab, open up the flasks, and then walk back to the lab. We would then send them south for analysis. Since we had to ensure that we got the best samples, we always had to walk into the wind. That means no lifeline because the wind was coming from a different direction every time. On this Wednesday, I had my little headlamp, walked out, and pulled my sleigh into the darkness. The darkest dark. I was a couple hundred meters out, and everything went black. I turned around. The lab was gone. The station was gone. Where we parked our truck was gone. I was alone with only a headlamp and a sleigh of empty glass flasks. I panicked. I had no radio no phone, not that they work up there anyway, and no clue where anything was. The wind was strong enough that I couldn't even find my tracks. I accepted my fate and just stayed put, heart racing. This was it. This was how I die. After the longest two minutes of my life, the power came back on. Worked overnight as a master control operator in my youth, One night, around 3 a.m., I catch sight of the camera we have aimed at the back door, and there's someone standing there 
wearing a scream mask, staring at the camera and not moving. I go to the back door, which is magnetically sealed and deadbolted for overnight. The door is next to impossible to force open, and look out the peephole, and there's no one there. Head back to control and see them walk back into frame, wave at the camera, and then walk away. Called the cops. They found nothing, and the camera doesn't record. It's live feed only. Worked overnights at two different 24-hour residential treatment centers for teens, aka poltergeist soup. We, staff and clients, would see and hear things, people, during the middle of the night, almost every night. I remember when I worked at a drug and alcohol rehab facility. It used to be a nunnery attached to a church. I used to hear women singing through our speaker that communicated with our doorbell for visiting hours. I could see through the window of the door from where I'd be sitting, and there was never anything there. This happened a few years ago when I was working at a car dealership. Our business had just moved into a new lot down the road, and the cars were parked in an open-air parking garage. One way in and one way out, with one set of stairs which was right by the entrance. So I'm hanging out at the entrance, and I hear a car door slam. I found it strange since no cars had driven in and no one had gone up the stairs. So I start walking up the stairs and I hear another door slam shut. I'm thinking, what the F is happening? Next day I tell my co-workers what happened. They all think I'm just delusional. Fast forward a week later. I had to travel down the road to another dealership to pick up some parts. The dealership I went to had just moved out from where my company had moved in. I walked down to the parts department and grabbed my part. As I'm walking away, the guy behind the counter asks if I've worked the night shift yet at our new place. I told him I had, and he quickly responded with, Be safe, that place is haunted. I immediately got goosebumps and proceeded to tell him what I had experienced just a week prior. He said it was normal and you get used to it. Freaked me out. Worked alone evenings, cleaning in a building by myself. I'd been there about three years by this time. I had on my headphones in the elevator, and the song I was listening to abruptly stopped partway through. Then Stairway to Heaven started to play. I didn't even have Stairway to Heaven on my MP3 player. It had never been on my MP3 player. I was working in Antarctica at a station with an elephant seal mating ground. I thought I'd left something in a shipping container by the docks next to the elephant seals. Mindful of my safety and being a bit lazy, I grabbed a oot, a utility vehicle, and drove down there at midnight. I parked and left the vehicle running with the lights on. As soon as I got out, I realized it was seriously dark. No moon, no building lights, can't see your hand in front of your face kind of dark. I hear heavy breathing coming from all around me, and I could hear the two-ton bastards starting to move. Whatever I forgot, waited until the next day. I work in a building that is high security because we have a lot of expensive equipment. If you want to get to my office, you have to walk through four doors that require keycard access. It's very quiet and sterile. White walls, nobody around, very little furniture, gray floors, open ceilings so you can see the ducts. Sounds echo here. I was working alone and noticed that there was a guy in the building. He was wearing the same shirt that maintenance wears, but it was weird because it was really late at night on a Saturday. He was also wearing jeans, and the maintenance people always wear black pants. He kind of gave me the creeps, so I closed my door and stayed there. I could hear the echo of him walking back and forth for a while. He tried the handle on my office door twice. I heard the beep of him trying to open my office door with a key card twice. Turns out he didn't work there. He is the grown son of one of the workers and was walking around the building trying to steal stuff. 
but his dad's key card won't open any offices because it's a handyman card with limited access. Handymen have to make appointments and you have to let them in, unlike cleaning people or the techs maintaining the servers who can open any door. He got caught on camera and security checked to see whose card had tried to open the doors. The guy got a fine for trespassing and his dad got fired. I have a workspace in an old former madhouse built by monks which had been turned into a hospital for SS personnel in World War II. Lots of spooky history. A huge building with long hallways and a stern 1920s architecture. Brick archways, ugly sculptures of long-gone monks. I usually worked late until 3 in the morning and am usually the last person to leave the building. One night in winter, I locked my room and went to the exit. All the lights were off and the wind was howling. Suddenly, I heard the sound of running footsteps in the distance. Lots of running footsteps. Then it was quiet again. I went down some stairs and there I saw little red lights blinking on the other side of a long, dark hallway just for a moment. Then they were gone. I was pretty freaked out at this point. I walked faster in the direction of the exit. Then I heard those running footsteps again. I turned a corner and suddenly a bunch of kids were screaming in my face. Almost had a heart attack. Turned out these kids were playing laser tag. They borrowed the keys to the building from one of their parents. They had these laser guns with red lights to shoot at each other and they were chasing each other through the dark building. They thought the building was deserted and almost crapped themselves when this big guy in a trench coat suddenly appeared in front of them. I work nights in a large warehouse-like store. It's just me and two others in the store at any given time. We used to have buttons all over the store that would page for help for our customers. I've been working at this location for five years and the supervisor for three of those years. Once a year, we'll have one go off and these things are not plugged in at all. The owners removed them from the system in my first three weeks here. They still go off sometimes. I used to work as a night janitor at a student union. Skirting tables for events was part of the gig. I was scanning my floor for what needed to be done that night and went into a room annex. Long, thin room with one wall entirely made of glass facing the river. I approached a skirted table that's against the glass wall and hear snoring. Sounds funny, though. I think it's on my radio. Assume someone fell asleep at work and rolled on to the talk button. Standing there for a few seconds trying to figure it out, I realize there's a homeless man sleeping under the table. His snoring was climbing the glass window and bouncing off the ceiling. That's why I couldn't figure out where the sound was coming from. If you've ever thought you were completely alone, only to find out you're within arm's distance from another person, your body becomes one big goosebump and your butthole puckers tighter than a dolphin's. It was freaky. I used to work overnight as a dispatcher and system monitor. Most days we had two people per shift. Pretty much the only reason that we wouldn't be is if somebody was sick or something. Most nights were completely uneventful, and I basically did nothing for eight hours. One night, around 1 a.m., I hear screaming like some girls getting murdered. My coworker and I both start checking cameras. Nothing. I grab my radio and start running through the building to find this girl. I run down to the first floor before I realize it's coming from the back parking lot. I exit the building, expecting to have to fight someone with a knife or see a rape or something. What I actually find is a girl alone in her car, just screaming and crying. I find out she just wanted to vent and was seriously okay. She thought nobody would be in the office park at 1 a.m. I promptly tell her to knock it off as it was absolutely terrifying and to please leave so not really that scary slash creepy slash strange at the end of it all, but it was absolutely the worst two minutes of my life as I was trying to find the screaming. To start off, I love listening to true crime podcasts. This summer, I worked by myself, 
in a greenhouse at my university that was on the top ninth floor of this building. To even get into the building, you need card access, but to use the elevator, you need card access and a key. Over the summer, almost zero people were ever on campus, and especially not on this floor, or even in the building for that matter. After probably six hours of working alone on the top floor of this building and listening to creepy murder stories, I was pushing my cart to the elevator, a massive industrial freight elevator that no one else uses, and I scanned my card and waited for the elevator to reach my floor. I could hear it coming, and it was taking a while, so I was still listening to this podcast about some serial killer. Once it was finally on the ninth floor, I got ready to open the outer door and happened to peer into the little window and see something inside staring at me through the window. I screamed and jumped back probably two feet before I realized it was just another research student coming up to use the greenhouse. Being alone for six hours and only hearing scary stories of people getting killed really messes with your nerves. I've been working in my trade for about 20 years. It can be really difficult to focus when all the young bucks are asking you questions and blaring terrible music, so I tend to start work when everyone else leaves for the night. I started hearing sounds upstairs like people talking, walking, opening doors. I dismissed it as my imagination for a few days but it got to be too much to ignore, so I started investigating when I would hear things. Never found anything. Thought I was going crazy, though. Turns out one of the guys that lived near the shop made a hidey hole nest up in the attic to hide from his girlfriend, like some kind of dumbass Phantom of the Opera. Up next a supernatural fog bank appeared to eat people alive in a Florida woods. And how did the devil's footprint get into a rock in North Carolina? These stories and more when Weird Darkness returns. Sometimes you feel a bit nutty, especially if you're a weirdo. If that feeling transfers to your taste buds as well, I've got some great news for you. Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy Coffee. Wrap your taste buds around this medium dark roast blend with shrouds of almond, honey, and chocolate. Each bag of Nutty Mummy is exclusive to Weird Darkness and is roasted to order, then bandaged, I mean bagged, specifically for you to ensure maximum freshness for you, your mummy, and anyone else you share it with. Entomb your old coffee and bring your taste buds back from the dead with Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Fog and mists have always had a strange allure for us, They invoke a certain sense of eerie beauty, yet at the same time, a feeling of dread scratching at the back of our mind. There's always been an irrational sense lurking somewhere within us that to enter a bank of sudden fog might mean to never come back out, that something malevolent and unknowable prowls within, and it is this that has caused mists and fog to become steady features upon the landscape of both horror stories and sinister legends. Although the innate creeping fear we may feel towards such fogs is largely unfounded and merely a vestige of some primordial irrational fear, there seem to be some cases in which the danger posed by mist is by all accounts real, and one of these is a supposed supernatural bank of fog that eats people alive. The location of this very strange series of events is the woods lining the Tomoka River west of Daytona, Florida. Beginning in the year 1955, fishermen and hunters in the area began to report seeing a strange, thick bank 
of pinkish mist that would form low to the ground out of nowhere and seemingly move about on its own accord, regardless of wind direction. Although this is perhaps spooky enough already, this cloud is said to have had some sort of corrosive property, supposedly stripping dead animals and even humans of their flesh to leave only bleached bones behind. It's even said that it is not only dead carcasses that were the victims of this ominous cloud, but that it also took living prey as well. Indeed, the cloud over the years has apparently been blamed for around a dozen mysterious disappearances in the area, as well as the discovery of unidentified human bones, and it's said that this ominous pink mist is almost like some voracious carnivore oozing across the landscape to devour all it comes into contact with. Some of the carcasses and remains found have rather gruesomely been described as appearing to have been melted or half-digested, and there have even supposedly been reports of the predatory fog in action, with animals, birds, or insects that come into contact with the mist said to drop dead and be ensconced by its wispy tendrils. The mist was also said to strip trees of their bark or dissolve brush, leaving swaths of dead land in its wake. Such sightings and strangeness continued up until 1965 or 1966, and there have been many legends as to what the bizarre cloud could have been. One popular theory is that it has something to do with a local native chief named Chief Tomki, who is said to have once been cursed for stealing a golden cup and drinking from some mysterious fountain of youth without permission. For his transgressions, the chief was hunted down and killed by other tribes, and his golden cup taken back. It is the spirit of Chief Tonki that is said to prowl the land, intertwined with the mist, although what connection any of this has is up for debate. Other ideas are that this is just folklore based on the odd color of light hitting the frequent fogs of the area, that it is swamp gas, or even that it is some sort of toxic cloud of lethal fumes formed by chemicals from industrial plants. On the site Weird US, there were several commentaries made by readers familiar with the area, one of them by a person called Welder2 who said, They called it the Cannibal Cloud when I was in school, and it was supposed to be pink and would eat the meat off anybody that came in contact with it. It wasn't swamp gas, it was more like a fog that really didn't cover but a small area in a low spot. If you go into the woods, called the Tiger Bay Preserve, right near the Tomoka River, you might be able to see it. I don't think you can see it all the time, just certain times of the year when we get a lot of fog. I don't think there's anything, though, to the cannibal stuff or people disappearing. I think it's just fog that reflects a pinkish color in that area. Most of these newcomers who have moved in don't know anything about it. You have to talk with people who were around in the 60s to hear about it. Another commentator, called NSB, said of the carnivorous cloud, "'There's a lawyer I know that could fill you in more on the pink cloud. What it was, nobody knows, except it was like a thick pink fog that covered a wide area of the Tomoka Forest. Now, there are claims that many people vanished in that area and only their bones were found. The pink cloud was blamed for the disappearances, and people said it would actually eat the flesh off your bones." Curiously, there is another unexplained phenomenon from the same area that may be connected, and this is the history of strange spook lights haunting the area of the Tomoka River at around the same time. For years, there were stories of anomalous lights flitting about the same woods that the mist is said to inhabit, and this light would often follow people about or even chase vehicles before vanishing into thin air. These lights are said to have been seen by numerous people over the years, who were more often than not left perplexed as to what they had just witnessed. Suzanne Hetty, executive director of the Ormond Beach Historical Society, had her own run-in with the mysterious lights on many occasions. 
of which she would say, The first time I saw them, as the car approached, they separated in two and went around the car and reformed behind the car. The second time I saw them, they formed in front of the car and went over the car together. There was a lot of speculation as to what it was. Nobody ever really knew what it was. Of course, the most obvious answer was aliens, but other people discounted it as swamp gas. But I find that hard to believe because they weren't reflective lights. In some versions of the reports, these mystery lights themselves were carnivorous and lethal, with the assistant manager of Tomoka State Park, Joe Isaacs, remaining skeptical but saying of these darker accounts, there are a whole bunch of versions about the lights. There's one person that says if the lights make contact with you, it would eat your flesh. It's a little gory. Locals say that a young couple that were parked on the side of the road were involved in an accident and died and that they are part of the haunting now. I don't want to be a naysayer, but I've lived here in the park for 30 years and I've never seen them. I think every town in the world probably has a legend like this. Whether these lights and the mysterious ravenous pink mist are linked or not is unclear, but what is known is that both phenomena seem to have ended at around the same time in the mid-1960s, leaving us to wonder just where these tales originate. Were these due to some sort of ancient Indian curse on the land? Is it ghosts, aliens, or other supernatural beings? Is there a chance that this really is just an optical illusion melded together with superstition and spooky folklore? If so, then why should it just begin in 1955 and then end approximately a decade later? There are no clear answers, but whatever the carnivorous pink mist or these mystery lights were, they remain a creepy bit of legend from this rural area that has never been truly solved, and perhaps gives us a reason to fear the fog after all. Devil's Rock is said to hold the footprint of Satan himself. Located off State Road 1131 in Largo, North Carolina, there is a place where the print of a left foot that is slightly larger than human size can be seen imprinted deep into a large rock. How did the devil's footprint get into a rock in North Carolina? This is one legend that starts in South Carolina. There in Flat Rock, the devil's matching right footprint can be found. Sometime in the last century, there was a man in Flat Rock who was reported to be one of the meanest men ever to walk the earth. This man spent his time brawling, drinking, cussing, and racking up a list of sins so long that if he wrote them all out, the paper would stretch for miles. Now this man grew old, as we all do, and nearing the end, he looked back on his life and knew where he was headed. He also knew he didn't want to go there. But the man was such a mean-spirited cuss that heaven didn't look like much fun to him either. So he set out a plan to avoid going to either place. When he knew his time was drawing near, the man went out and bought a bunch of the sharpest tacks he could find. He then went up onto the rock from which Flat Rock gets his name and spreads these tacks around, covered them with old leaves, sat down, and waited. Soon enough, the devil appeared before him, come to carry his soul away to the fiery pits below. You ready to go? The devil asked him. I am, said the man, but before I do, I'd like to get a good look at you. I've been on your side this whole life. I've heard so much about how magnificent you are to look at. I know that you're a busy man, and when I'm down in your place, I won't get much of a chance to see you, there being so many wicked people up here needing your attention. So if you could kindly step back a bit so I can take you all in, I'd much appreciate it it'd be the best reward I can think of in this evil life I've led. Now, the devil is a vain creature, and he ate this flattery right up. He puffed himself up and stepped back to show off and stepped down hard onto those hidden tacks laying on the ground. The devil hollered and jumped up in the air. When he jumped, 
he pushed down so that he left his right footprint in that rock in South Carolina. He went up so high that when he landed, he landed miles and miles away in North Carolina. And when he came down, he came down so hard that when he hit the ground, he forced his left footprint into that rock in Largo. After that, Satan was too scared to have that man, and heaven wouldn't have him either. So now, his ghost walks the earth up and down between those two footprints, laughing to himself all the while. When Weird Darkness returns, one of our weirdo family members didn't used to believe in the supernatural, but then he demanded that the ghost prove it exists. Now he's a believer. And mysterious fires and moving objects have been terrifying the residents of a house in central Morocco. These stories are up next. Urban legends are thought by most to be tall tales passed down through the ages. Some of the stories are obviously make-believe, while others, as strange as they may seem, have their origins in actual events. Do alligators roam the dark tunnels deep beneath New York City? Do boogeymen who terrorize those afraid of the night really exist? Are killer clowns a myth born from our fear of the unknown? Or could such evil truly walk among us? These are just a few of the urban legends that are explored in this book. After hearing some of the history for yourself, maybe you will be able to answer the age-old question, could it be true? Could It Be True, Volume 1, Urban Legends by Cindy Parmiter, narrated by Weird Darkness host Darren Marlar. Hear a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. A longtime friend of mine used to live in an old house in Austin, Texas. His grandfather had owned a house right next to his parents' house. His grandfather used to tell him stories of seeing ghosts roaming the property late at night and hearing strange noises in his house. At the time, I didn't believe in ghosts, so the stories he told me I just politely listened to and didn't give them much creed. One night, we'd been hanging out, and I drove him back to drop him off at his parents' house. While heading back to his parents' house, we'd been discussing the ghosts that he'd said he'd seen over the years and how he never goes outside at night unless it's just coming or going into his house. As I pulled up next to his parents' house, my friend got out of the car and then reached in the back seat to grab some books he'd bought. While he was doing this, I began to mock the idea of ghosts and loudly proclaimed, if there's a ghost around here, show me something, prove to me you exist. Suddenly, the dome light in my car that had come on when he opened the door suddenly shut off and then back on. My friend turned white and quickly said, see ya, as he slammed my car door closed and ran into his house. As I drove away, I couldn't breathe and felt as if something had its hand around my neck. As I drove about two blocks away from his house, the tension suddenly disappeared and I felt immediately calm and could breathe again. The next day, I told my friend what I had felt after I drove away. Well, he said, my grandfather told me that many years ago, the two blocks around my house had grave sites that were eventually built over. It seems as I left the area where the grave sites had been, that's when I felt relief from whatever had decided to grip my neck and prove to me that there were indeed spirits around and listening. Mysterious fires and moving objects have terrified the residents of a house in Imilchil, a small town in the Midelt province of central Morocco. It's hard for a human mind to accept a fire in a house in the Imilchil area of Midelt province 
for no reason whatsoever for almost three months, leading behind a panic in the whole family and material damage caused to the family by the situation in which it found itself. In this regard, activists on Facebook broadcast a video of the young people in the area talking about the mystery house that puzzled all the inhabitants of Immelchill, wondering about the reasons for the flare-up of those fires which the owner of the house occasionally was surprised by, demanding the authorities to interfere in the hopes of saving the family from the homelessness hovering around them, where the state holds the responsibility for what will happen to the family. The activists added that they did not trust the story of the burning of the mystery house, but they replaced the doubt with certainty when the fire broke out in front of the house moments after joining the head of the family in a visit to check in and support them, and were convinced that there is a mystery in the house where the parents live with their children. Therefore, they appealed to the authorities to intervene immediately and bring everyone who can solve the mystery that bothers the family, whether it is scholars or sociologists or others. Ali Abnaha, the head of the family, confirmed in a call to Hespress that he had been suffering from the burning fires for three months. Here is the translation. Until this morning you contacted us, the house was burning and things are moving from place to another inside the house, and we don't have any idea who moves things. Their son, Moyam, a father of five children, said in the same statement in the newspaper that neighbors and relatives were tired of helping them on a daily basis. People have come to support me and my children. They are excused because everyone here suffers from the same bad economic situation. They can barely feed their children because of the lack of employment opportunities in the region. Ali, who is 41 years old, said that nearly 20 scholars and sheiks had visited the house and recited some verses from the Holy Quran to protect the house, but to no avail. He was afraid that if he wanted to move to a new house in Dwar, the owner of the house would refuse that for fear that his house might be cursed and then burned. He also said that they still spend the night in the house, despite the fire, to ward off the cold. The head of the family is demanding immediate and urgent intervention to save him and his family from homelessness, because Ibelchil is a mountainous region and many snowfalls will double the plight of the family in winter if the situation continues as it is. The Hess Press newspaper report included a video link with an activist talking excitedly about events at the house. The English translation is as follows. Before two months now, we heard that fire ignites regularly out of the blue in this house. We all did not believe that, but some students and youths of the region decided to make a visit in solidarity with region in order to make sure of the phenomenon. Once we get in this living room and drank a cup of tea, we went to discuss and see the scientific and metaphysical dimensions of the phenomenon. We were surprised that, after a few seconds of the fire ignited, and you can see the ash in this video. Accordingly, we implore the local and regional authorities as well as the government to immediately intervene. If they believe in science, we ask them to consult chemists in order to study this phenomenon. And for those who believe in religion, they can send and consult mullahs to religiously study this phenomenon. This because we were among those who do not believe in this phenomenon, but as we visited this region, we discovered it coincidentally, as you all the people can see. There are among us here students here, are well educated and aware as well as teachers to name not a few. There are all witnesses of the situation. Therefore, we implore the state and we appoint it responsible for all what has happened and will happen here. We also implore the benefactors, those who are knowledgeable in religion or in experimental sciences to provide help either through sharing this video or providing materialistic or moral help. We also want the mullahs to explain this phenomenon. We will attach the phone number of the father of the family and the son they are suffering from this phenomenon for more than two months. The regional authorities have sent him two tents and they were both burned. We are approaching winter, which is very hard in Immelchil, wherein the temperature reaches minus 15 I will spend their night outdoors. Every night the fire ignites in this house. He told us that it had ignited before we came in moments, but we did not believe that as many of you will do. 
Still, we observe the place and the fire ignited in front of our eyes. Thus, we implore the state to intervene through sending experts in religion and chemistry to study this phenomenon while he is suffering from deterioration as well as the whole family. His wife now has been feeling dizzy. As you can see, she is in a coma. His children has become homeless, and he spends his nights outdoors. The fire regularly ignites in his house. Therefore, implore the state, the scientists, the religious mullahs, and the benefactors to immediately intervene to solve this puzzle, which has the topic of every discussion in the region. This man is known and poor. He barely covers his daily expenses as he is a daily worker. Now the family spends the nights outdoors, though there is some help from the habitants of the region. And then someone spoke in a local dialect, saying, Even the habitants of the region have given up. They used to do their best to provide help to the family, but the repeated ignition of fire destroyed everything. People have become afraid of this phenomenon. As you can see, we observed this phenomenon, but we could not figure it out. I point the religion official, governor of the region, and the whole authority of the state responsible until they solve this puzzle. Also responsible are the Religious Council of the Ministry of Religion and Islamic Affairs and the Ministry of Environment. Finally, we hope that benefactors would share this story on a large scale or provide either materialistic or moral help to the family as they can contact the phone numbers of the house owner and his son mentioned in the story. For everyone who can help, they should contact them at their phone numbers and thank you. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me anytime with your questions or comments at darren at weirddarkness.com. Darren is D-A-R-R-E-N. Weirddarkness.com is also where you can find all of my social media, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, visit the store for Weird Darkness t-shirts, hoodies, mugs, phone cases, and more merchandise, sign up for monthly contests, find other podcasts that I host, and find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression or dark thoughts. Also on the website, if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. All stories in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find source links or links to the authors in the show notes. Creepy Working Alone Stories was written by Stephanie Hammond for Ranker. The Strange Tale of the Carnivorous Pink Mist is by Brent Swanser for Mysterious Universe. Devil's Rock is posted at North Carolina Ghosts. Demanding Proof was written by Weirdo family member Christopher Gray and submitted directly to Weird Darkness. Poltergeist in Morocco was originally posted in Hess Press of Morocco, translated by The Fortian. Weird Darkness is a production and trademark of Marlar House Productions. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Galatians 5 verse 13 you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. And a final thought, when you dare to begin, you're halfway there. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness.